In this example, we're given a parallelogram, L, M, N, O. So the first thing I'm going to do is, since I know I have a parallelogram, the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and label opposite sides parallel. That's the definition of a parallelogram. Notice that I'm using single arrows and then double arrows just to represent that these two sides are parallel, but they're not parallel to these two sides. Um, so the first thing I know is, since I had a parallelogram, I know that those opposite sides are parallel. Next thing is I can go ahead and label angle M as 120 degrees and angle LNO, so LNO is 20 degrees. So then based on this, whenever you have a parallelogram and you have parallel lines, you want to be looking for your alternate interior angles, which are your Z shape. So here I see a Z shape which means I have congruent alternate interior angles since the lines are parallel. So that means if this angle here is 20, well, so is this one because it's an alternate interior angle being cut by parallel lines. So that's the second statement I can make here. And then the next thing is to find this angle right here. And because I have a triangle, so because this shape is a triangle, that means that those three angles have to add up to 180 degrees. So if I do 180 degrees minus 120 minus 20, I'm going to have 40 degrees is what I'll be left with. So this angle here would be 40. And then from there, since we have another Z shape, which is going the opposite direction. So since I have this Z shape here, so from here, to here, to here, that means angle 40 is congruent to this angle over here, which is also 40 degrees, which is the angle that we were trying to show, LNLO, which is also 40 degrees, because again, these lines were parallel and their alternate interior angles um, have to be congruent since the lines are parallel. So that finalizes that. So that's our last reason there. And then from, for the next example, we're also looking at explaining why we have parallel lines. So for this one, we're going to start off with labeling our diagram. So the first thing that I see that's important is GH and IH, so GH and IH are congruent. So right away, I see that as an isosceles triangle. Make sure that you're looking for those things. So as soon as you see two congruent sides, see if it makes an isosceles triangle, which it does. So if it makes an isosceles triangle, then these two angles here are gonna be congruent, and I'm gonna call those angles one and two. And then if those are congruent, we also know that EGB, is 40 degrees if I just read the description down here DIG is 110 we're trying to explain why would these two lines AB and CD why would those have to be parallel so if you're trying to prove parallel lines or explain why lines are parallel it means you got to have congruent alternate interior angles, congruent corresponding angles, congruent alternate exterior angles, supplementary same side interior, um, congruent corresponding angles. So you have to be able to show that you have a pair of those congruent angles or supplementary same side interior or supplementary same side exterior to get that the lines are parallel. So I continue making conclusions based on what I have. I know one and two have to be congruent. I also see that these two angles, angle 2 and angle 110 here, have to add up to 180 degrees because they form a straight line. So that means I can find angle 2, which is going to be 70 degrees because it's supplementary to angle DIG. And then that also is going to mean that angle 1 is 70 degrees because angle 1 and angle 2 are congruent because they're the base angles of an isosceles triangle. So that's the next reason here. And then from there, since I know that each of these angles, I'm going to go ahead and label those, are 70, that will allow me to find this angle right here. 
to be 40 because if you do 180 minus 70 minus 70, you're going to get 40. And then if you notice, these two angles, angle 40 here and angle 40 here, if we look at our diagram, those angles are going to be corresponding angles. So here's your two parallel, or here's your two lines, here's your transversal. These two angles are your corresponding angles because if you were to take this angle 40 and slide it down, it would overlap with this angle 40. And since those are congruent, these lines have to be parallel. So whenever you have congruent corresponding angles, the lines have to be parallel. So these are actually going to be parallel. So that's basically the justification for it. So here's the final reasons here. Since we have the angle, all three angles in a triangle add to 180, the measure of angle 3 has to be 40. And then from there, we can say that um, angle 3 and angle EGB are congruent, because, and congruent corresponding angles implies parallel lines. And remember, angle 3, what I'm talking about, is this angle right here. So that's our angle 3. So then on the next page, we have a couple other examples. So again, we're starting with a parallelogram. So the common theme when you're talking about parallel lines seem to come from parallelograms because by definition a parallelogram has opposite sides are parallel. So that gives you those parallel lines. So if this is a parallelogram, that means I know that opposite sides are parallel. It's the first thing you always want to be thinking. And we're trying to prove angle C, D, B, so this angle is congruent to A, B, D. So hopefully right away you recognize those, you see the Z shape and you're recognizing those as alternate interior angles. And if we have a parallelogram, we have opposite sides are parallel, and then parallel lines cut by a transversal implies congruent alternate interior angles, which is why that has to be true. So we basically just have to write all of that up. It's a really quick proof. It's just a three-step proof here. So we have our given it doesn't really say like specifically what the given is, but the given is up here. You're given a parallelogram. So that's important because if we didn't know if that was a parallelogram, we wouldn't be able to say that these lines are parallel. So our given is that we have parallelogram A, B, C, D. So that's given. And then the first conclusion we make from that is that we have opposite sides are parallel. So it's true that both pairs of opposite sides are parallel, but I only care about these two because there's my Z shape. So it's going to be CD is parallel to AB. Those are the sides I care about. And that's because a parallelogram implies opposite sides are parallel. And then from there, I know that angle C, D, B must be congruent to angle A, B, D because those are alternate interior angles and parallel lines imply congruent alternate interior angles. So parallel lines, which is what we have from the previous step, implies congruent, make sure you say congruent alternate interior angles. If you don't say congruent, um, we always have alternate interior angles whenever you have lines cut by a transversal, but what makes them congruent is the fact that they're parallel lines, so that's important. And then that's the proof, so it's very short. And then the last example here, again, given a parallelogram, so the common theme is parallelograms to get those parallel sides. So whenever you have parallelograms, again, we're looking for those congruent alternate interior angles. So as soon as I read that, I'm looking for that Z shape. So here's the Z shape that I see because I have a transversal right here with that diagonal. So as soon as I read that, I can see that these two angles are going to be congruent. As soon as I read that because of the lines being parallel. Same thing would be true um, for the other side, but we don't have a transversal to be able to make that Z shape. So that's why I only worried about this side. Um, then we look at what's given to us. We have angle S is 65. Angle SRT, so SRT is 73, and angle D 
T W U is 38. So I don't know the measure of those angles, but I do know that they're congruent. We're trying to find the measure of W V Q. So I'm trying to find this measure right here. So what I'm going to do um, first is I see that I have this large triangle. So I see this triangle right here. And I know two of those angles. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract from 180 degrees these two angles so that I can find this alternate interior angle. So first step here, I'll do 180 minus 65 minus 73 to get 42. So this angle is 42. And then that means this angle is 42 because I have parallel lines cut by a transversal, so I get congruent alternate interior angles. And then from there, I need to be able to find this angle. So if I could find this angle right here, I know that those are supplementary. So if I could find that angle, I could just subtract it from 180 to get the angle that I need. So the other angle that stands out to me are these vertical angles right here. So I know that this one's also 38. And then once I see that, I'm seeing another triangle. I'm seeing this little triangle right here. So this little triangle has two angles given to me, and I could find the third angle. So the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do 180 minus the 42 minus 38. And that'll give me 100 degrees. So that means this angle right here is 100. So then the last thing to do, well, these two angles are supplementary. They have to add up to 180. So the last step, it will just be take 180 degrees, subtract 100, and we get 80. So that means the measure of angle WVQ will be 80 degrees. So we use a lot of 180 here. So we use the fact that all three angles in a triangle add up to 180. And we also use the fact that supplementary angles or angles that form a straight line add up to 180. And we looked for a lot of little triangles within the bigger picture. We use parallel lines because we had a parallelogram. So we had congruent alternate interior angles. We also use vertical angles. So a lot of different reasons here were used just to be able to find that angle.